for the government. And then they call it a loan. Of course, they don't print it all because most of it's checkbook money. But nevertheless, the process is the same as if they had just turned on the printing presses and printed all this money and gave it to the federal government. So now, once the Federal Reserve System creates this money out of nothing, literally, it's fresh money into the society, into the economy, and that's how the money supply keeps growing and growing and growing. What about the banking partner? What's in it for them? I come in and I give the bank, say, 100 ounces of gold, and the bank offers me some interest payment on that. They're going to pay me 3% interest. And they're going to take that 100 ounces of gold and they're going to lend it out at 5%. That's how they make their money, the 2% spread. Okay? Now that's fine so far because I know that gold is in there, it's being loaned out, and someday now I'm getting 2% interest and someday I can ask for that principal back. It might be six months, it might be a year, whatever it is. Where the trick comes into this is the bank says, not only are we going to lend that money out, but we're going to allow you, Mr. Depositor, to draw on that money right now. All right? Which means that they can't possibly be saying that I can draw 100% of that deposit when they've also loaned out 100% of that deposit. Now, maybe they don't loan out 100%, maybe they don't loan out 90% or 80% or whatever it is. And that's the fractional reserve concept. They don't have enough reserves to pay out all of these obligations that they've made, especially with respect to paper currency, because usually that's the way it worked. Now, why do they do this? Well, they do this because they make money. Right. If I can loan out essentially more than I have in my reserves, by that difference I'm increasing interest payments. So the bankers are beneficiaries of this, and obviously the early, the first lender, the person that receives that money is a beneficiary because he's getting money he wouldn't have gotten otherwise, even though he has to pay interest on it. But then what happens down the line? This is the fascinating part about it. The market has set prices and wages on the basis of what it believes is the total amount of money that's in circulation. Along come the banks and they start generating new money that the market doesn't know about. It finds out about it because the money goes into circulation. So I'm the first user of this money. I've just received the loan from the bank. I'm going to go out and buy cement with it. And when I buy cement with it, cement is at the original market price. Now as that money starts percolating into society, the market realizes there's more money than there was before. More money chasing the same amount of goods means the prices of goods go up, right? So eventually, somewhere down the line, that same cement that I just bought for $5 a pound is going to cost someone else $6 a pound. Now, if he buys that cement at $6 a pound before his income has increased commensurately, what's happening to his real wealth? He's losing real wealth, right? His costs have gone up, his income stays the same, his real wealth is decreased. Whose real wealth has increased in this transaction? Mine and the banks, because we got the full value of the money right at the beginning. So this system transfers wealth somehow. You can't exactly follow it, but the principle is there. It transfers wealth from society to the creators of money. For every billion dollars that's put into the banks, I, as a commercial banker, can create an additional nine billion dollars and push them out into the economy as loans. Now that nine billion dollars based on the one billion, which itself was created out of nothing, all of it is just fiat money. It's created out of nothing, but the commercial banks get the bigger end of the deal, as you can see. They can create nine for the private sector called loans, and these are genuine loans, and that is where our money comes from. That is how money is created. Every bit of it is created in this fashion. Every bit of it is based upon debt, and that debt creates money that literally has nothing behind it at all. Now this is how money is created in the Western world. And it's an amazing story. Only a very few people at the top know how money really comes into existence. Best estimates say that a network of about 7,000 people, mostly located in large urban areas worldwide, facilitate the acquisition and control of the voting stock of these banks by proxy. The marching orders as to where literally hundreds of trillions of dollars of monetary power will be directed are believed to be given by the 7,000 on instructions from an insider control group we estimate to number about 300. 
Of the 300, many are related to one another by blood, marriage, and business ties. And, it would seem, have family ties to the original robber barons of the Industrial Revolution at the turn of the 19th century. More importantly, however, most of the 7,000 involved in this group may be largely unaware of their negative effects on society. They may sincerely, but naively, believe they are simply doing good. Nevertheless, now talking about the 300 who form the inner controlling body, we estimate that about 50 of this group are anything but naive. Thus, having successfully established the ultimate money-making machine, the Federal Reserve System, this nefarious cartel of tyrants is in a position to literally acquire control over the assets of the world, deprive the people of all their prosperity, as Thomas Jefferson would say. This is the calculus of the situation, and this is exactly what they are doing, with a little help from their virtuous but ignorant servants in Congress, as John Adams might say. Yes, the Founding Fathers must surely be rolling over in their graves. The original intent of the Constitution is spelled out quite clearly, not only in the document, but in the immediate history that surrounds its formation. Now, Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1 limits the powers of the states. It says, no state shall coin money. States had coined money. It stops them from doing it. No state shall emit bills of credit. Now, that's one of those peculiar words. If you were living in that time, you knew what it meant. It meant essentially what we call paper money. No state shall emit bills of credit, which means that a state itself cannot create paper money, and then it can't do it indirectly by setting up some kind of a bank that's controlled by the state. Third provision in that clause is, no state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. And notice the language, no state shall make anything but gold and silver coin, meaning states can and should make gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. But the historical background shows absolutely clearly that paper money was not going to be allowed at the national level or the state level. And the very interesting point here is that the same people who wrote the Constitution had been to a large extent in control of the states and of the Congress under the Articles of Confederation during the War of Independence. These people had emitted large amounts of paper money. The states did it. Congress did it. When that Congress did it was called continental currency. And most people are familiar with the phrase, not worth a continental. Paper money depreciated so radically in value that it was essentially worthless. Those same people looked back at what they had done only a few years earlier and said, we're not going to do this anymore. The inflation isn't rising prices. The inflation is the government's program of increasing the supply of money, which devalues the currency, and that causes the prices to go up. Inflation, that is the destruction of money, eventually wipes out the middle class. The best example in the 20th century being uh, what we saw uh, happen in Germany. As the runaway inflation came, the middle class got wiped out. In the early stages, of course, somebody benefited. Uh, eventually it hurts everybody. But in this country right now, we have constant uh, insidious inflation. So there is a transfer of wealth from the poor and the middle class to the wealthy. But because it affects the business cycle and causes prices to go up in general, who suffers the most? The people who can afford it the least, that people on fixed incomes, low middle income people, poor people. I think it especially hits hard low middle income people who are trying to make it on their own and won't go on the dole because their prices go up more and they're the first ones to lose their job when the business cycle turns down. The Federal Reserve, by increasing the credit, creates the boom part of the cycle, but then there's always the resulting downturn of the cycle when unemployment rises. We're always live. It's almost impossible to believe that the all-powerful dominant media, what Bill O'Reilly calls the elite media, would endlessly cover all these issues yet be silent on the very subject that is common to all of them. Money, and the entity that creates and manages the so-called money supply, the Federal Reserve System. 